we're told that the West has lost its way, that our civilization is increasingly morally decadent, that we are suffering a crisis of meaning because of a God-shaped hole in our culture. It was thinking along these lines that led none other than Ian Hersia Lee, the noted atheist free speech activist, to announce this past November that she was converting to Christianity. She's not the only one who's thought this way recently. What is it that leads ostensibly intellectual people to think that religion is any kind of source of meaning and guidance in this life? And what's the proper secular response and alternative to this view? Today, we're going to grapple with some of these questions. We're going to grapple with them by taking a look at a short video that was recently released by Prager University. You may know Prager is not a real university. They're an online platform that I think is increasingly representative of this back to God, back to religion movement in contemporary conservatism. And we're specifically going to comment on a video came out on February 12th by Owen Anderson, who's a philosophy professor at Arizona State University, commenting on why he thinks religion is necessary for morality. In fact, he doesn't just say that. He says fear of God is necessary for morality. And if you think of philosophy as the rigorous, reasoned pursuit of truth, come what may, you may be surprised, if not shocked, by the kind of argument that Mr. Anderson gives for this conclusion. So let's, let's take a look at what he has to say. On the first day of my Philosophy 101 class, I ask my students this question. Does life make any sense? A few awkward moments pass. One hand goes up and then another. No, life doesn't make sense, many students tell me. It seems arbitrary and full of pain and suffering. How does this make them feel, I ask? They tell me it causes them anxiety and even depression. Well, what do they plan to do about it, I inquire. They have no answer. And this, of course, only adds to their anxiety. I should start out by saying that this is a real problem and deserves a response. And I used to be a philosophy professor myself. I saw students who had the same problem. And I was eager to show them how philosophical reasoning could lead them to a solution. So what is the solution he's going to propose? Let's continue to watch. Fortunately, there is an answer. It's called wisdom. Not exactly a fashionable concept these days, but given how much mental illness is reported on campus, it's primed for a comeback. So where should we start on our wisdom journey? So let's get this clear. The problem is anxiety. Anxiety is a kind of fear. The solution, he suggests, is wisdom. Where are we to begin on this journey of wisdom? Let's see what he says. How about with the most significant and influential book in human history, one for which there is no close second, the Bible? Well, that's a bit of a shocking answer. I thought we were looking for answers in philosophy. Philosophy, the independent, reasoned quest for truth. But the Bible is an ancient desert religion text appealed to as a mere matter of authority, not any kind of reasoned conclusion. You won't find arguments in the Bible. But let's look to see if he has anything further in defense of this rather provocative statement. Not surprisingly, it has a lot of thoughts on the subject. Proverbs 9.10 takes us right to the heart of the matter. The fear of God, the proverb tells us, is the beginning of wisdom. Whoa, that's a bold statement. Let's unpack it and see what we find. That sure is a bold statement. And let's remember what we were talking about. We were trying to find a philosophical solution to the problem of anxiety. Remember that anxiety is a form of fear. It's fear about one's own ability to deal with life. And now the suggestion that we're being given is that if you want to deal with that kind of fear, what you need is an even bigger kind of fear, fear of an all-powerful being who rules the universe. That's a strange way to go. But if wisdom is your concern, and the Bible thinks it should be, then fear of God is fear number one. Why? First, 
To fear God is a recognition that you are not God. Life suddenly has order. A clear hierarchy is established. God, then man, then animals. If you take God out of the equation and place ourselves at the top of the pyramid, then we make the rules. We only answer to ourselves. The whole notion of an objective standard of right and wrong goes out the proverbial window. Morality becomes a matter of opinion. Since human beings can rationalize any behavior to suit their purposes, the result is moral confusion, even chaos. All right, now I really have to stop because this idea that without God there's no moral order is really just without basis. He started by saying that when we have to write rules for ourselves, we get confusion and chaos. But is that true of all rules that we write for ourselves? What about the laws that we pass against murder? Those are there to contain chaos, even though we wrote them. Now, his comeback is probably going to be, yeah, but laws won't be taken seriously unless they're informed by a religious morality that involves the very fear of God that he's talking about here. And those can only come from religion. But why think that that's true? After all, he himself is right here in this clip saying that if people don't have rules, then you'll get confusion and chaos. How does he know that? Did he know that by reading it in the Bible? Or did he know it by simply observing the consequences of amoralism in reality today? I suspect it's the latter. But then if that's something we can know about life, that without any kind of rules or norms or moral principles, we get chaos. Well, that's knowledge that can inform the very moral principles that we're drawing up for ourselves. Uh, and we don't need the Bible to do it, as this argument itself demonstrates. I, of course, work for the Ayn Rand Institute. And Ayn Rand was a philosopher who thought that we could formulate a scientific code of morality on the basis of observations that we make about what human beings need in order to survive. The basic principle, she thought, was that in order to survive, we need to think and we need to produce. And we need to draw up a code of moral virtues around these basic needs. Codes of virtues like honesty, integrity, productiveness, pride, that help us achieve key cardinal values like reason, purpose, and self-esteem, the values that make life worth living. So that's a proposal for a secular code of morality that this argument about the Bible simply ignores as not a real possibility. But there's a deeper question that we should ask here, which is why is it that relying on religious edicts is supposed to give us any objective standards in the first place? Let's see what he says. When we fear God, he did create the universe after all, we take our rightful place in the hierarchy. We're up there, but we're not in first position. To acknowledge this is an act of humility. It's much easier to acquire wisdom when you don't think you already know it all. As it says in another verse in Proverbs, do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and shun evil. This is rather astounding because remember, this whole argument began with the idea that in order to solve the problem of the anxiety of our age, what we need is wisdom, the wisdom of philosophy. But here he's saying we need to abandon wisdom. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Now, of course, he'll think that there's some kind of higher wisdom that we should pursue instead. But if you think that philosophy means pursuing the truth on your own, that's out. That's the sin of pride. You should instead be humble. Now, this is often sold on the basis of saying, well, you can't know everything or you don't know everything, which is true. But what this actually implies is that you can't know anything. You can't know anything on your own, not without the, not without the assistance of the Lord, who will give you some higher truth through his dictates, through his will, through his whim. So if, if you're Abraham and he commands you to kill your only begotten son, then you must be willing to do it, and it's virtuous to be willing to do that. How is that supposed to be an objective standard of morality? It sounds like it is a standard of morality that's based on a whim, not on any kind of mind-independent facts. The whim, the will of the Lord, the love of the Lord, is simply some expression of his consciousness. This is no source of objective, fact-based guidance that you acquire through scientific pursuit of truth, far from it. It's the opposite. 
but he throws in a little science to make his argument seem a little plausible. Second, fearing God will very likely make you a better person. There are academic studies to back this up. A 2012 study published by the Public Library of Science found that fear of divine punishment leads to more ethical behavior. So I took a look at this study, and it does indeed show that there's a correlation between countries which have a low crime rate and countries which believe in hell as much as they believe in heaven. Note here the equation of ethical behavior with simply not committing crimes. This is to say nothing of what you think ethical behavior might also involve, the pursuit of positive values, not just the avoidance of negatives. But it should also be kept in mind that there was a very low crime rate in the USSR, in Soviet Communist Russia, where most of them didn't believe in God. It was an atheist country. Why was the crime rate so low? Because, of course, the Soviet citizens simply feared worldly punishment from the Soviet authorities. Does that mean that when they were cowering in fear from these tyrants, that they were inspiring moral virtue on the part of their citizens? I don't think so. And that's worth thinking about when you look at this data, because much of the data here is skewed by theocratic Muslim countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia, where indeed the people also cower in fear, not necessarily because they fear divine punishment, but more likely because they fear the very worldly punishment from the mullahs and the other theocratic rulers who, offered to, who threatened to punish them in just the same way that the Soviets did. And again, it's worth, it's worth asking the question, are these countries making people more virtuous by inducing fear? Is simple fear really what moral motivation consists of? Doesn't moral motivation consist instead in love of virtue, love of the values that you want to pursue in life, that you think might make life worth living. That point is also relevant to the following clip. Just as most children fear their father, wait till your father comes home, we are to fear God's wrath. Many of the most important commandments in the Bible, like do not put a stumbling block in front of the blind, are immediately followed by the phrase, you shall fear God, I am the Lord. In other words, if you act in an unethical manner, I, God, will know, and there will be consequences. Fear God, and you're much less likely to do something you shouldn't. By definition, that will help you make smarter decisions. That's some serious wisdom right there. No, it's not. This part gets me really angry, because how is it any kind of wisdom to model morality on the motivation of immature, misbehaving children? That's a completely childish, paternalistic view of what moral virtue consists in. Incidentally, it's also a ridiculous view of what a good parent is. Are you a good parent if you're only motivating your children by fear of punishment? If you're not doing anything to help encourage them to love what is good in life? How is cowering in fear any kind of solution for the anxiety of our age? But there's more. And third, if you fear God, you will fear others less. Doing what is right becomes easier even if the consequences are not to your immediate advantage because you know you must answer first to God, not people. This will give you courage as well as wisdom. Sorry, courage comes not from fear, but from self-esteem, from confidence in the power of your own judgment. That's what you need to be able to stand up against those who oppress you. But everything about the worldview that he is now encouraging undercuts self-esteem. He's calling for us to be humble, to not trust our own, our own judgment, to defer to a higher authority. How is that supposed to give you courage? Of course, you might dismiss everything I've just said with one simple objection. You don't believe in God. You're an atheist. So this means nothing to you. You might be surprised to know that the Bible anticipates your objection. The Psalms tell us, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Sorry, this is not anticipating an objection. It's not answering an objection. To say, the fool has said in his heart there is no God, is simply to try to intimidate people who disbelieve the thing they're supposed to believe. This is what Ayn Rand called the argument from intimidation, which substitutes instilling fear for actual argumentation. 
There's no claim made here why the atheist is wrong to think there is no God. There's no argument given for why there is a God. It's simply inducing more of the very fear that this overall worldview wants to induce and even celebrate. And it's the opposite of philosophy. A philosopher doesn't say, don't you dare believe this, uh, this unholy view. The philosopher offers arguments for why something should be true. This is not a position befitting of a professor of philosophy. If, however, you're looking to make sense of what appears to you now to be a senseless world, Proverbs 9.10 is well worth contemplating. Well, Mr. Anderson closed with a quote, so I'll do it too. And this time I'll give you a quote from Ayn Rand, who I think is commenting on an issue that is directly relevant to what we've just seen happen in this video. She wrote in 1957 in Atlas Shrugged the following, A mystic is a man who surrendered his mind at its first encounter with the minds of others. Somewhere in the distant reaches of his childhood, when his own understanding of reality clashed with the assertions of others, with their arbitrary orders and contradictory demands, he gave in to so craven a fear of independence that he renounced his rational faculty. At the crossroads of the choice between I know and they say, he chose the authority of others. He chose to submit rather than to understand, to believe rather than to think. Faith in the supernatural begins as faith in the superiority of others. I'd like to give you some more resources on following up on some of these ideas from Ayn Rand. So one thing I'll start by doing, in addition to recommending her novel, Atlas Shrugged, uh, is to suggest a shorter article by my colleague Ankar Gatte, Finding Morality and Happiness Without God. You can see that at bit.ly slash finding hyphen morality. That'll offer a positive secular alternative along the lines of what I've been talking about today. I'm also going to be doing a debate on this subject on the campus of the University of Texas uh, this April 17th. I'll be deba debating a theologian, Adam Johnson, on the question of what are the roots of morality, divinity or biology. Uh, you can guess which of these answers I would give. And one more announcement also having to do with the University of Texas. The Ayn Rand Institute will be hosting a conference on the campus of the University of Texas in March, in just a few weeks, March 22nd through the 24th. The theme of the conference will be centered around Ayn Rand's nonfiction essay for the new intellectual, which is her view of intellectual history and what explains the intellectual and cultural bankruptcy of our civilization today. It has a lot to do with philosophers' failure to offer a rational defense of a code of morality. So please consider applying for that conference. Go to events.einrand.org slash ARCUS. If you're a student, you can get a scholarship and we'd be very happy to see you. I'm looking forward to seeing you in Austin coming up very soon, where we will talk about this and many other issues.